On the basis of documents turned over to the courts by the president, and on the personal testimony of General James Wilkinson and General William Eaton, Aaron Burr, on June 23, 1807, was indicted for treason. A week later, he was committed to the penitentiary outside Richmond. His fate hinged on two questions of vital importance to the very future of politics and public life in America. How was the crime of treason to be defined? And how was it to be proven? There were two conflicting answers, provided by English common law on the one hand and by the Constitution of the United States on the other. Under English law, the crime of treason was rather loosely defined. Moreover, all members of a treasonable assembly whether they participated in the actual act of treason or not, were equally guilty. Under the Constitution, on the other hand, only an actual act of war against the United States was considered treason. Furthermore, the crime had to be proven by two witnesses to the same act. Aaron Burr, the indictment charged, levied war against the United States on Blennerhassett's Island in westernmost Virginia. There, a body of armed men had assembled in accordance with his plans. Aaron Burr had not himself been physically present on the island at the time. Under the circumstances, was he guilty by association as stipulated by English law? Or was he innocent because he had not, as the Constitution required, personally levied war? There's evidence enough to indict Aaron Burr. There'll be enough to convict him. Come, come, Mr. District Attorney. Smile. Let's see a little smile of confidence. There's no cause, Mr. President. We barely scraped by. Barely succeeded in showing probable cause. To secure a conviction, we shall have to furnish proof. That's going to be extremely difficult. Why? I don't see any difficulty. We can show that he planned the insurrection, set it in motion. Well, that won't clinch the case, Congressman. American law sharply limits the crime of treason. According to the Constitution, uh, let me quote, treason shall consist only in levying war against the United States. Note the word only. Or in adhering to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort. Or adhering to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort, yes. In any case, we shall have to furnish proof to secure a conviction that Burr actually levied war against the United States, committed an overt act of some kind. I should think it would be sufficient, Counselor, to prove an overt act on the part of his men, the men on that island, Blennerhassets. Burr will be guilty because of his association with them. In treason, says the law, all who are connected with it are equally guilty. What law, Mr. President? Common law, English common law. I should think you'd know it, Counselor. No, oh, I know it, of course, Mr. President. But is English treason law supreme in America, or is the Constitution? I'm taking the liberty of doing counsel's work for him. If you will, forgive me. The Supreme Court ruling in ex parte Bowman and Swartout. You recall it, of course. Certainly. It Purports to define... It defines what the law is in this case, Mr. Hay. All who levy war against the United States, says Mr. Marshall, whether present or absent, all who are in league with the conspiracy, whether at the scene of the assembly or performing some 
minute and inconsiderable portion of it, a thousand miles from the scene of the action, all incur equally the sentence of the law. All are equally traitors. Now that, it seems to me, should do for Mr. Burr. What's that face you're making, Mr. Hay? In my opinion, Mr. President, the Supreme Court ruling notwithstanding, no American government should demand the application of English treason law to the United States. Least of all, this government, which stands committed explicitly to the protection of the individual against tyranny in every form. No government, Mr. Hay, can afford to protect the rights of the individual to the point of sacrificing the safety and welfare of the whole. The founding fathers abhorred English treason law, wished no part of it. The language of the Constitution makes that as plain as day. Yes, but the Founding Fathers devised the Constitution first and above all for the purposes of safeguarding the nation, of forming a more perfect union, of providing a common defense, of establishing domestic tranquility, which is precisely our objective. It has been said that English law with respect to treason has stained English history with blood and filled English valleys with Innocent graves. Innocent graves. I think you're forgetting, Mr. Hay, that we arrested Burr and his men arms in hand. Arms in hand. And that if we had failed, if their conspiracy had succeeded, the Union would have been destroyed. Now, you may question my loyalty to the principles of the Constitution, if you will, sir, but not my determination to fulfill the obligations of my office. My personal inclination matters not at all, sir. Not at all. The people expect that I will protect their country and its government. And I will not fail them. I understand, Mr. President. It's not ten days since a ship of ours, the Chesapeake, was fired upon and destroyed by a British man of war in peacetime on the specious pretext of capturing deserters. And this was done with no fear of reprisal. I say it again, Mr. Hay, we must furnish proof that America is willing and able to defend herself against all enemies, internal and external, by whatever means necessary for her survival. Marshall has kindly furnished us with the means by which we can hang Aaron Burr. I desire that you take full advantage of them. With a recent ruling in the case of Bowman and Swartout, the Supreme Court itself appeared to have placed the noose around Aaron Burr's neck. Eric Bowman and Samuel Swartout had carried a letter from Burr to General Wilkinson, the very letter in which Burr outlined his plans to attack Mexico. Wilkinson had arrested the two men and had sent them to Washington, there to be tried for treason. Bowman and Swartout, upon their arrival, had appealed to the Supreme Court. They had committed no crime, they claimed, in the District of Columbia. They could, therefore, not be held there for trial. With this, the Supreme Court had agreed, and it had ordered that the two men be set free. But then John Marshall had gone on to define, as a matter of principle, what he thought the crime of treason consisted of. In so doing, he had provided precisely the argument with which the prosecution was now trying to clinch the case against Aaron Burr himself. Aaron Burr was not physically present on the island when his men assembled there. That is admitted. But his actual presence is not necessary to prove his guilt. Though not physically present, Burr was legally present. Present by construction of the law. That, Your Honor, was the argument of the Supreme Court in the case of Bowman and Swarthout. If I may quote it, if war be actually levied, that is, if men assemble for the purpose of effecting by force a treasonable design, all those who perform any part 
however minute, however remote from the scene of action, and are actually leagued in a conspiracy, are to be considered as traitors. Your Honor, the government intends to show that men did in fact assemble for the purpose of effecting by force a treasonable design on Blennerhassett's Island, and that Aaron Burr performed a part in the assembly by planning it and setting it in motion. If this be proved to the satisfaction of the court, then, on authority of the Supreme Court, it must follow that Aaron Burr is guilty of levying war at Blennerhassett's Island, as charged by the indictment. The government now calls its first witness, General William Eaton. Hand on the Bible, raise your right hand. You solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do so swear. Please be seated. General Eaton, you had several conversations with the accused last summer. What was the substance of these conversations? You described to me a plan for starting a revolution in the territories west of the Allegheny Mountains. What was this plan, General? Colonel Burr said that he was going to set up an independent empire in those territories. New Orleans was to be the capital. He himself would be the emperor or chief. Where was he going to get the army to carry out this plan? He said that thousands of men from Kentucky and Tennessee would join him and that the army of the United States would go along with his plan. Did you ask him the legality of all this? <laughs> yes, sir, I did. And what was his answer? He said that revolution was the right of the people inherent in the Constitution. General Eaton, you do understand that you're under oath to tell the truth. Yes, Your Honor. Um, all this the accused told you himself, General? Yes, sir. It was a pretty hot conversation. Colonel Burr was angry at the federal government. He said that it had no character, it had no energy, and it had no gratitude. And what did you answer him? On that, I agreed with him. You did? Yes, sir. The government owed me money for a long time, and it wouldn't pay up. All right, General. Now, what can you tell us about the events on Blennerhassett's Island, uh, about the men who assembled there, armed with... Nothing, sir. Well, about their plans and intentions? Nothing, sir. Nothing at all? No, sir. Thank you, General Eaton. Your witness, Mr. Wickham. General, you said that the government owed you some money. Does it still owe you this money? Do I have to answer that question? What is the purpose of the question, Mr. Burr? I wish to show that this witness is biased against me. You will answer the question, General. Well, then, the answer is no. The debt has been paid off. When was it paid? About four months ago. After I was arrested? Yes. And after you told the government about the conversation that supposedly took place between you and me? It did take place. Was the debt settled after you told the government about the conversation? I guess so. Yes or no? Yes. And how much money did the government give you to settle this debt? I don't remember exactly. Well, inexactly then. About $10,000. How much? Ten thousand dollars. It is known that John Marshall, just as the trial of Aaron Burr began, had doubts about the Supreme Court's ruling in the Bowman and Swartout case, and that he turned for advice to his colleagues on that court. One of them was Justice Bushrod Washington, a close friend and fellow Virginian. In your opinion, Mr. Washington, does the ruling apply to this case? The prosecution, I'm told, assumes as much. It is the law, uh, as laid down by the uh, Supreme Court. Should it be revised? Revised? Why? The Constitution says that treason is the levying of war. Now, what's the meaning of that term? How broadly should we interpret it? Is it enough that men assemble with treasonable intentions? 
Or must those intentions be indicated by a, the use of force, an open deed? And are only those guilty who actually perpetrate the deed? Are those guilty too who merely associated with the perpetrators? The interpretation we've laid down, Mr. Marshall, is so fine a net as permit only the smallest fish to escape. It smacks of English treason law for certain. Devised to permit English courts to chop off enough heads to glut the vengeance of the crown, yes. Exactly what is the point, sir? Need I remind you, Mr. Griffin? There isn't a juryman who hasn't admitted a prejudice of some kind against Colonel Burr. Is that true? It is. No unbiased jury was to be found. The president saw to that. And the press. Oh, Burr meant to attack Mexico. We have that in his own writing. As to his intentions to divide the Union, we're asked to believe Generals Wilkinson and Eaton. Eaton. A braggart. A braggart looking for a favor from his government. And Wilkinson? A man trying to save his own skin by accusing Colonel Burr. You ask if our ruling should be revised. Well then, yes. Yes. If there is as much room for doubt as you plainly feel there is. Well, how can it be revised? When the Supreme Court takes up and decides a case, well, the country assumes, as it has every right to, that a binding precedent has been set. You're mistaken, Mr. Griffin. Bowman and Swartow were not on trial for treason, as you will recall. They sued for writ of habeas corpus, which we granted. The rule which we're considering here did not affect the judgment in their case. Hence, it's an incidental opinion. Legally not binding, but binding, nevertheless, in my view. Consider, Mr. Washington, the Chief Justice's sentiments toward the President are a matter of public record. So far in this case, everything he has done conforms with them. He has released Burr on bail, contrary to the urgent desire of the government. He has castigated the government's conduct of the case. He has spoken of the hand of malignity, Words which, no matter how he intended them, are generally believed to have been aimed at the president. If he were to revise his opinion, opinion on which the prosecution has built its case, who would believe he had done so in the interest of justice? Colonel Burr and I were having dinner together, and we were talking about the weakness and imbecility of the federal government. At one point, he said to me, that the union of the states could not possibly last. It would break down naturally in four or five years. Did you say anything about his ideas? I said, God forbid. And what was Mr. Burr's response? He kept talking. He said that the federal government was so inept that he himself, with 200 good men, could drive the president and the Congress into the Potomac River. And with 400 or 500 men, he could capture New York City. Your witness, Mr. Burr. General Morgan, do you remember my tone of voice when I was making those comments? I believe I do. How would you describe it? Light. Bantering. Did I sound as if I were joking about all this, or did I sound serious? You sounded as if you were joking. I was on the island that night when Mr. Blenner has to come home. He seemed scared. Someone said something to him and he told him, don't bother me, I've got enough troubles already. After that, the boats arrived. Now, how many boats were there? Four. How many men were on the boats, uh, approximately? Oh, about 30. Did they have guns with them? Some of them did. Did you ever hear them talk about fighting a war? Yes, sir. One of them said he was going to sail those boats down in Mississippi and storm New Orleans. Now, what happened when they heard that the militia might be coming to arrest them? They got mightily worried and excited. They loaded up the boats again, and Mr. Blennerhassett and all of them took off lickety-split. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Mr. Burr? You said that one of the men talked about attacking New Orleans. 
Was he the only one of these men who told you where they were headed? Oh, no, sir. Another man. He told me he was going to find a silver mine. And another one said he was off to settle some land in Texas. Uh-huh. And why did they run away when they heard the militia was coming? Most of them seem to fear they was going to be attacked. <laughs> and you're quite sure, Mr. Albright, these men had at least five rifles and four or five pairs of pistols in their possession? I'm positive. Did you ever see them use these pistols? Uh, yes, sir. When the government sent a man to arrest them, a man by the name of Tupper, uh, he laid his hands on Blenner Hassett, and he said, your body is in my hands in the name of the Commonwealth. Uh, some such words he mentioned. Uh, they had seven or eight muskets leveled at him. The men pointed muskets at an officer come to arrest them? Yes, sir. Uh, one of the men that was holding a musket said he was as mind to shoot Tupper as not. And then Tupper said, gentlemen, I hope you will not do the like. Or did Tupper arrest them then? Oh, no, sir, he didn't dare. Thank you, Mr. Albright. I've finished with this witness, Your Honor. Does counsel for the defense wish to cross-examine? No, Your Honor. May I ask, Your Honor, if we are going to hear further evidence with respect to an overt act of war? Mr. Hay? No, sir. Mr. Albright was our last witness with respect to that. Then, Your Honor, we move that no further testimony be admitted, which bears on Colonel Burr's alleged intentions. It has been charged that Colonel Burr levied war against the United States on Blennerhassett Island. The prosecution has failed to establish on the testimony of two witnesses, as required by the Constitution, that war was in fact levied by him at Blennerhassett Island or anywhere else for that matter. Testimony as to his intentions to levy war, therefore, must be irrelevant. We move that it be barred as inadmissible. Objection, Your Honor. An assembly of armed men took place for a treasonable purpose. That has been shown. It has therefore been established that war was levied at Blennerhassett Island. Now, as to Mr. Burr's I'll part... Hold your horses, Mr. Hay, for just a moment. In your opinion, can war be levied without the use of force, an open deed, without the occurrence of actual violence? Your Honor, we maintain that war, and that's the quintessential meaning of the word, is an appeal from reason to the sword. Intentions to go to war may be proved by words, but the actual going to war must be proved by the open deed. Counsel for the defense implies that we must wait for bloodshed and murder before we may justifiably speak of treason. Perish the thought. I ask this court, if men were to assemble with a treasonable design upon the lives of the president and the members of his cabinet, must we wait for an open deed? Must we wait until our heads of government are slain before we may say that war is being levied against the United States? No, Your Honor. Treason is committed the very instant armed men assemble with a treasonable design. And our men did assemble with a treasonable design on Blennerhassett's Island. By Aaron Burr's orders and under his command. What of it? Even if the men on Blennerhassett Island levied war, and we are far from admitting that, Colonel Burr did not levy war. Then under the Constitution, Your Honor, only the actual levying of war is treason. Your Honor. If the men on Blennerhassett's Island levied war, and we maintain they did, Aaron Burr is guilty. We again refer this court to the Supreme Court decision in the case of Bowman and Swarthout. It states plainly what the law is in this case. All who levy war against the United States, whether present or absent, all who are in league with a conspiracy, whether on the spot of the assembly or performing some minute and inconsiderable part in it at a thousand miles from the scene of the action, they all incur equally the sentence of the law. They are all equally traitors. The mind is troubled like a fountain stirred. And I myself see not the bottom of it.
Brother Washington, your advice. If you'll forgive the impropriety of asking your opinion on the case not before you. Don't apologize. Old men like to give advice. As solace for no longer being able to set bad examples. If you stand on English treason law, if you define the levying of war as broadly as an English court would in this case, and rule that anyone connected with it, whether at the site or not, is equally guilty, then Burr is a dead man. If you stand on the Constitution, if you define the levying of war as requiring an act of violence and rule that treason consists only in the levying of war, then Burr undoubtedly must be set free. All depends then on how you interpret the law. You ask my advice. Well, here it is. I believe that when an individual comes in conflict with his government, we must always, and particularly when there's room for doubt, provide him with the fullest protection available under the law. For if the law is not his defense, what defense has he? What defense has he? And the very agencies devised for his protection and welfare combine to crush him. The army, the navy, the treasury, the body politic. I looked up and there was none to help. He sustained the motion, sided with the defense, ruled all further evidence with respect to Burr's scheming and plotting inadmissible. Let's see it. Why? Now Burr, Mr. Marshall said, was charged with levying war. To levy war, he went on, meant the actual use of force, violence, uh, an appeal to the sword. To convict Burr of treason, therefore, as charged by the indictment, it was necessary to prove an overt act of war an open deed on his part. For only the actual levying of war under the Constitution was treason. Well, in, in other words, he could not be convicted simply because others, those with whom he was associated, levied war. That's not how he ruled in Bauman and Swartout. He uh, maintained we misunderstood his ruling, misinterpreted it. Misinterpreted it? Now, Mr. Marshall took great pains at explaining it. He said that it meant that to be guilty of treason, a man need not be present at the scene of action. But he had to perform a part which made possible an overt act of war, an open deed, actual violence, just like um, a commissary of purchase or a recruiting officer, without being on the battlefield, made it possible for an army to engage the enemy. Well, isn't that precisely the part which Burr performed? He recruited men for the purposes of levying war. Well, that's a fact. Quite possibly, Congressman. However, the indictment didn't charge Burr with recruiting men for the purpose of levying war. It charged him with levying war. And Mr. Marshall said that the indictment must be proven as laid. Angels of darkness. The law is invoked not to crush the traitor, but to protect him. I can't take it in. Well, to bring the story to its sordid end, Mr. Marshall concluded by saying that uh, since there were no witnesses to an overt act on the part of Burr, it couldn't possibly be said that he levied war. Whereupon the jury acquitted him. The jury didn't acquit Aaron Burr, Mr. Marshall did. 
Once again, Mr. President, the judiciary sets itself up against the will of the people, against their elected representatives, as they have since the day on which we took office. Why? Damn it, why do we permit it to go on? How do you propose ending it, Mr. Giles? The remedy I suggest, an amendment to the Constitution. All government officials must stand election and re-election. Why not the judiciary? If the president fails in his duty or a member of the Congress, the day is never far distant when the people will remove him. Now why should the judiciary be impervious to this censure? An oversight on the part of the founding fathers, let's correct it. I should like a Mr. Marshall removed. That would mean more to me than the conviction of Aaron Burr. You do hate the man. I warned you it would spoil our efforts. And it has. Hate? I don't hate John Marshall. It's his principles I cannot abide. At heart, he's more of an Englishman than he is an American. Institutions matter to him. The law, not people, their welfare. Oh, I don't mean to say that obedience to the law, to the principles of the Constitution, is not a high duty. It is, but it isn't the highest. Self-preservation, the laws of necessity. Saving your country when it's in danger. These are higher obligations. To lose our country because of a scrupulous adherence to the written law is to lose the law itself, with life, liberty, property, and all those who are enjoying them with us. An absurd sacrifice of the end to the means. Mr. Marshall will never understand that. Never. Ask the amendment, Mr. President, now. The people will give it to us. They're angry enough, believe me. that four choice spirits are tonight to be marshaled for execution by the hangman. Oh, yeah. In consequence of a sentence pronounced against them by the unanimous voice of every honest man in the community. Oh, yeah. The respective crimes for which they suffer are thus stated in the record. First, Chief Justice Marshall. Oh, yeah. For his felonious capers in open court. <laughs> his quid majesty burn. You're taking this calmly. You're mistaken, my friend. No man looks on calmly when he's hanged in effigy in the streets of his hometown. But it was to be expected. Judge Griffin warned me. The country will question your motives, he said. Well, there's the proof of it. I suspect he himself has never ceased questioning them. Tell me, Mr. Marshall, would your ruling have been the same if the accuser's name had not been Thomas Jefferson? What you're asking is, do I deserve this? because I set myself up against the president for improper reasons. That is the way you put it, isn't it? Improper reasons. The answer is no. The president violated the Constitution, Mr. Griffin, not I. He violated it when he pronounced Berg guilty before he'd been tried. When he so prejudiced the public mind, I could not find an unbiased jury. The president violated the Constitution. When I extended to the accused the full protection of the law, I sustained it. And there is nothing improper in that. You sustained it, yes. After chastising the president. After ordering him into court like a common plow jogger. After revising a Supreme Court decision, which had you stood by it, would have led to a verdict of guilty. 
I was partial, yes. But not toward Burr, Mr. Griffin. Not toward Burr. We fought a war for the rights of the individual. Among them, the right to due process of law. If we fail to protect them now, to protect the Constitution in which they were enshrined, that long and costly war would have been fought in vain. We shed precious blood. I saw it shed. I was there. I saw men suffer. I saw them die. At my side. Men who believed their last breath in what they were fighting for. That I will always be partial to. The ruling passion, Mr. Marshall, be it what it will, the ruling passion conquers reason still. True, but then, what are the standards of our profession? Genius, subtlety, knowledge, away with words? More is required, Mr. Griffin. When the case demands it, we'll encourage our required to stand against doubt and suspicion both within and without, against the anger of friends and neighbors, in defense of what we perceive to be our duty under the Constitution. No man undertakes such a defense lightly. No man had either choice would drink the bitter cup to the bottom. By demanding that the principles of the Constitution be strictly observed, John Marshall stepped between Aaron Burr and death. Possibly a guilty man escaped. But it is an incontrovertible fact that the door was closed forever on political abuse of the treason charge in America. A great issue was settled. In prosecuting Burr, Thomas Jefferson first and foremost sought to secure the nation from internal enemies. In extending to the accused the fullest protection of the law, John Marshall first and foremost sought to forge the judicial process into a means of safeguarding the individual from oppression by his government. It can be said that John Marshall succeeded. The law remained master, not the will of the government. This is the meaning of the Burr trial. This is its significance in American history.